Welcome back. It's Steve from Featherlight Studio. And in the last episode, we talked all about Cubase's metering system. And since that time, Cubase 11 has come out, and it is just packed full of brand new features and workflow enhancements. We got effects like Squasher, a brand new multiband dynamic processor. We got Frequency 2, which is a completely redesigned dynamic EQ. We have Imager, which is multiband widening. We have Supervision, which is an amazing new multi-metering tool. We've got a brand new sampler track with a ton of new content. We've got brand new sample content, things like Bloom and Hard Knocks and cinematic stuff like Noir. We've got things like export improvements, which is going to make your life so much easier and faster. We've got some MIDI editing improvements, brand new things like scale assistant and live input. We got new marker behaviors. We got automation snapping. We've got a version of spectral layers finally included. We've got scoring improvements. We've got engine optimizations, a ton of stuff to explore and unpack. So let's get started. We're going to use a project that we've been working on from a Northwest artist. Her name is Christy Bean. She's a great writer and engineer on her own right, but she also runs Snob Hill Studios up in Coeur d'Alene. So I'm going to leave that information in the links below. And this project is called Crazy. It sounds like this. So some great guitar work there by uh, Alan Bean as well. Great session player. So this is a great place to start and really start diving into some of the brand new workflow and features of Cubase 11. So we're going to move over to our console view. And this is the main full-size console view to get a better visualization of what some of these new effects can do. And we are going to start with Squasher. This is the brand new dynamic processor inside of Cubase 11. And this thing is just a beast. We're going to start with the regular compressor first, just to get a couple of comparisons so we can kind of see what's really going on here. So regular compressor has pretty standard settings, ratio attack, hold, release, uh, makeup gain, and mix knobs, for example. So if you want to do parallel compression, whatever, we'll get more in depth in um, specific kinds of compression in a future episode. But for the time being, really what we want to do here is just see how it compares. So in this particular case, in a regular compressor, as we drop the threshold setting and the volume of the signal crosses that threshold, the compressor wakes up and basically starts to apply this much compression. And that's set by the ratio. All right, so if we just slam the thing, you can see the compressor wakes up pretty quick and starts applying that four to one ratio pretty fast. And it really slams the signal. We bring this threshold setting all the way back up and we effectively hear nothing being done to the signal. All right, so that's, a, that's basically how the normal compressor works in Cubase. And it's important to note that it's a single band device, meaning it affects 100% of that drum track. All right, so now we're gonna disable that and we're gonna go over to the brand new Squasher. And the first thing to notice about this is that it's a three band device. This actually has three completely different bands to operate with. That would just make it a regular multi-band compressor. And that would be impressive in and of itself, but it goes way past that. So to really understand the difference, we're gonna collapse this down to a single band device so that it's more comparable to this over here. And that'll help us understand a little bit more about what it's actually doing. If we click on the graph icon here, it basically takes us to this same view. So if we drop the threshold setting for here, for example, we can see that that's the threshold it has to cross before the compressor wakes up and does something. And then when it wakes up, it's doing this amount of work. Our downward compressor button here is effectively this kind of compressor. So raising our knob here is effectively the same thing as raising the ratio control on our normal compressor. But it's important to note that the ratio here is expressed as a percentage and not as four to one, five to one, 10 to one. Just an FYI, but it's something to be aware of. And as we drop the threshold setting for the compressor, the downward compressor, it's exactly the same as dropping this threshold button. So you can see the graphs respond similarly up there. If we want that to be about the same as four to one compression, it ends up being somewhere around 25 to 27%. Somewhere around there is pretty close to what that setting is as well. And the threshold determines the same thing. It's also important to note that the mix knob here behaves the exact opposite of this one. So it's a little confusing. When this is in its zero position, you're hearing 100% of the effect. 
Over here, when this is at that position, you're hearing 100% of the effect. So it's exactly the opposite of this. The same thing can be used at 50%. You could use it as a parallel processor, but for clarity's sake, it's important to understand that you're hearing 100% of the effect when that slider is at 100%. Let's start our drum playback, drop our threshold setting, and as you can see, operates exactly the same way as a regular compressor does. The graph here is indicating how much compression is actually being applied to the signal, and this is how much of that ratio, how strong the effect is actually going to be. All right, up till now, things have been pretty standard in compressor land. However, this is where it really starts to become a completely different animal altogether. What this guy does is work a little bit like kind of the opposite of an expander, for example. And what that means is that that threshold setting, which is now this guy here, is going to take the noise floor, meaning the quietest parts of the signal, and make it louder. It's going to bring the volume of the noise floor up, and it's going to do that once the volume of the track falls below this bottom threshold slider setting. So let's enable all three bands and hear what it sounds like when we play back the drum track. All right, so there you can hear, hear it bringing the noise floor up way, 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 way up. You can hear the cymbal die off even when the cymbal's really quiet. <laughs> so there are some possibilities for some crazy sound design stuff. In addition to the fact that that's working in a three band environment. Each one of those controls could affect each frequency completely differently. And those frequencies are completely determinable by simply moving around the sliders here. Each one of those has its own graph view so you could see what they're doing. So let's check out a couple of real world mix examples. In this first example, we got an upcoming rap and hip hop project from our good friend, Don Morpheus. And in this song, he is just killing it on this track like he always does. It sounds like this. Marathon, Autobahn's best. No blood money, bud money, green. No taxes, get your ass ran over in the Ford Raptors. Rise up the enterprise, firm is confirmed. I stay on the path with no U-terms. Capitalize on cap. All right, so everything is about where we want it to be, and it sounds great. We got the bed tracks mixed down uh, to a single file, so we can kind of treat those differently than the vocal production. Everything is about where we need it to be, but what we want to do is we want to bring out a little bit more of the bottom end, especially the kick and the 8085, and we want that top end to surround the vocalist a little more. We want it to kind of envelop the vocalist without making anything louder. We don't want to change any of that stuff for the mix or anything. That's all great. We just want it to kind of glue together a little bit more. So we're going to use our first example of the squasher here. We're going to add a little bit of drive to the low end frequency down here just by itself. And we're going to add a little upward compression meaning we're going to bring that frequency range up a little bit more. We're going to do the same thing to the mids, but not nearly as much. And we're going to do the same thing that we're doing to the bottom end over here to the top end over here. We're going to actually add a little bit of drive to that as well. And we're going to add a little upward compression so that it's bringing out some of the high end detail and stuff. So here's what it sounds like before. Marathon, Autobahn's best. No blood money, bud money, green, no taxes. Get your ass ran over it. And then here's what it sounds like after. And we're just applying this to the bed tracks. None of the vocal production part. Marathon, Autobahn's best. No blood money, bud money, green, no taxes. Get your ass ran over it. And forward Raptors rise up the end. So before. Marathon, Autobahn's best. No blood money, bud money, green, no taxes. Get your ass ran over in the Ford Raptors Rise up the enterprise firm is confirmed I stay on the path with no U-terms Capitalize on capital firmly established Alright, so you can hear in this example that it's added a lot more punch and presence and drive uh, so pressure uh, to the low frequencies that we have that are determined by this band here. It's about uh, 98 to 100 hertz down. And on the top end, same thing. So from this area, about 3K up, it's added a little bit of drive to the top end of the frequencies and added a little bit of upward compression. So it's bringing the level up of that as well when it's in its quietest parts. And it just kind of helps surround the vocalist a little bit more and kind of envelop it. In this next example, we got a dense rock mix from our good friends, the Vandross Band. This is a killer Northwest band we've mentioned in episodes past. Sounds like this. And listen specifically to the snare. 
All right, so the snare sounds great, and we don't want to change anything, especially the volume of it, because by raising the snare level, that's going to affect all the downstream processing, in addition to whatever automation and stuff we have on this. What we really want is the snare to be not quite so pretty. This is a big, full guitar sound, tons of crunch. We need something to compete with that. So really, in short, we need something angrier. We need something with a lot more punch and drive that's going to compete with that without dramatically changing the volume of the sound. And we're going to use Squasher to accomplish that and bring out a bit more of that kind of top-end sizzle. And we're going to do that by adding upward compression, which are these three knobs here, and in in addition, we're also going to add some drive. So the drive settings here, especially the ones in the mids, that's really going to be responsible and the one in the high for adding a lot more of that mid-range snap and kind of guts to the snare itself. So here it is without it. All right, and let's check it out and see what it sounds like with it. All right, so as you can see, that's really brought out a ton of the snap and kind of throaty mids of the snare. A lot more of that snap, it's got a lot more attitude. So here's without. With. All right, so in this particular example, it's really been effective at just bringing out the snap and not just throwing a bunch of EQ on there, but with the combination of the drive and the upward compression, it's enabled us to change the attack character of it and bring out a lot more of that kind of mid-range snap, which is really hard to get just by EQ alone or simply by raising the volume. Next up in the brand new effects is frequency two. And although this looks a lot like the original frequency, a lot of stuff has been changed under the hood. So the thing this most directly compares to is our trusty workhorse, the Waves F6 plugin. And we love this, it's on every single project that we do. Uh, it's dependable, it does what it says it's gonna do, and it's just been great to work with. So we finally have all that power hardwired into Cubase natively. And aside from being more CPU friendly, for sure, um, we're already used to working in this environment because we're really used to frequency. So it's already a great plugin that's been hugely upgraded. So now when we click on this little dynamics processor button right here, this turns it into a fully fledged dynamic EQ. And then we can see that it starts to duck the frequency only in that range. And in the opposite direction works exactly the same way. So these are really powerful. And if we double click up here in any of the banner areas, we open up the advanced processing window. And this gives us access to all the much more advanced controls, things like the Q and the frequency and the gain of each one of the bands. We can switch back and forth between mid-side and stereo operation. The dynamics controls here can be all individually set, as well as all the side chain choices, including all eight bands. That opens up a huge range of powerful options uh, for our already trusty and dependable Frequency 2 uh, EQ plugin, in addition to all the other features that it already had. So now that it's fully dynamic, this just opens up a wide range of possibilities. It's a huge time saver, and it works dependably just like F6 did. So uh, the increased amount of CPU friendliness and stuff just is a welcome addition. Next up is Steinberg's brand new Imager plugin. And this thing adds some super powerful widening and position control for the stereo field. So for example, here's our regular uh, isolated drum tracks. And we'll turn this off for the time being. When we engage this, we can take specific bands, because this is a four band device, and stereo narrow or widen just those bands. So for example, let's start here in the low mids band. And you can hear that really tightens up the snare itself. Really makes the snare dead in the middle if we widen that the other direction. That really widens the band of just that band area, those frequencies right there. We can do the same thing. So for example, if we wanted to take just the kick drum sound and narrow that so it's right in the center, that low band information now is very stereo centric and we'll even do a little bit of the low mids as well. But we're gonna take the high mid frequencies and we're gonna widen them out. And then the very top. So 
So this almost acts like a, an exciter because by widening just the top end of those high-end frequencies, it spreads them around the stereo field, adds some detail and articulation, while narrowing the low mid frequencies and the low frequencies so that our bass, for example, and the low end of the snare isn't all over the stereo field. So that's Steinberg's new imager, really powerful stuff. And the fact that these bands can be individually adjusted for whatever your program requires really makes this a real powerful addition. We'll get way more into this in a future episode. All right, and next up is Steinberg's brand new Supervision. This thing is a meter on steroids, and it probably closely compares to, or the most closest comparison is gonna be Waves Loudness Meter. And this has been a trusted plugin for us for a long time. We've learned how to use it over a variety of different projects, and we've really learned to trust that. So when this was introduced, Supervision, we are like, oh, cool, new meter. But that's really because we didn't understand just how incredibly powerful this thing could be. So as we drag out this meter here, first its default position is just a standard LED peak meter. So the fact that it can be set up on any of the areas, either the stereo buses or left, right channels, all those things, that's all very nice and, and convenient and all that. But that's really where the comparison to the loudness meter stops. And here's what I mean by that. This can be segmented up in any configuration you desire. So for example, over here, this could be regular peak LED metering off the stereo bus. This could be LUFS. So let's change this over here to loudness. So now we have side by side our standard peak LEDs and we have LUFS on the right. And then we can divide it up even more. <laughs> so for example, we could have LED peak metering on the other side could be our LUFS meter. And the bottom one could be, this could be our spectrogram. Crazy now. Crazy and we could do it over here as well. So let's segment that up. Over here, let's make this one, any one of these choices, literally, this can display just about every known kind of metering right now, all in one completely configurable environment, all simultaneously. Crazy now. So this one's currently dis showing our chromogram, which is the frequency-based or note-based display. Crazy. <laughs> but that's not all. If we hit that button over here, that segments the even more, and then we can add even more of these levels. So for example, let's make that particular display, uh, let's make that our phase scope. Crazy now. So that's given us a real-time readout of this phase display of these readings. We could do the same thing here, for example. We could segment that out one more time. As we hover our cursor in the upper right-hand corner of any one of the individual segmented meters, that simply collapses that meter and then frees up that real estate for another kind of meter or to be able to expand it into something else. So as you can see, Steinberg has done a really good job at adding some incredibly powerful and specific metering to Cubase 11. And really with all these effects, any one of these would have been worth the price of the upgrade alone. This has really turned out to be a really evolved, mature, and powerful product. All right, so that's a quick look at some of the brand new effects plugins that come with the new Cubase Pro 11 update. Hey, if you learned something or if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. In the next video, we're going to move on and check out some of the brand new instruments and workflow enhancements, and especially the brand new Spectral Layers plugin.